I just got it shipped over. <laughs> it's been in my parents' house and it's traveled with us. It's been on quite a journey. I was thinking the other day I should write like a children's book or something about a, p a grand piano that sort of like travels the world because that's what the that- traveling piano. Piano. Well, you know, one of my favorite films when I was a kid was called The Yellow Rolls Royce. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't know it. And part of why, and I'm gonna to talk to you about this another way a bit later was, I developed the biggest crush on the actress Ingrid Bergman. And she was in that film. And while she was in better films than the Yellow Rolls Royce, it was a very good one. I was just the right age and she was, I mean, she was 50 something and magnificent. That was my first crush. And I came to understand for listeners for whom English is not their first language, crush means a special attraction, a romantic, but not necessarily infatuation. I could, for example, have a crush on the on Rossini, the sure. man. I never met him, but everything about him and his music. I have a big crush on Rossini. But mm -hmm. the first time that I was alerted to my own potential to have a crush was with Ingrid Bergman in that film. And the reason I mention it now is it was the story of a car, of an automobile a yellow Rolls Royce. And it passed to many different characters and the film was in three different episodes. And she played a courageous woman during World War II, driving resistance fighters, including the very handsome Omar Sharif. And you wondered, you know, would they have a relationship? Would they not? And they were two both very attractive cosmopolitan people. And you should see that film. Um, and then take inspiration to write a book about the traveling piano or whatever you'd like to call it. <laughs> I will, um, I'll have a look at it, sounds like you know, Typically when I start these conversations, I want listeners to know you and I are very close old friends. So the conversation will be different than it might've been with people I'm just meeting for the first time online. Yeah, it's not, it's not like an interview as it were. No, 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 I don't do that. Gotcha. Um, but normally when I do these Adagio conversations, I save the music recommended by my guest for the end. Last week with Lawrence Brownlee, we just mentioned at the very end. You, however, I'm going to start with the music you recommended because oh, really? <laughs> you, with one little exception, have come up with the list that would be closest to mine if really? I were to do a list. Absolutely. And oh my gosh. it just struck me because, you know, we, I've had wonderful people and all the music they've picked is great and I admire it and sometimes I love it. But your list, with one little exception, would be the list that I would create, except I'd add a little more wow. Rosini and Berlioz. But basically, it is Mozart's Piano Concerto number 23 in A major, Kirschel 488, played by Menachem Pressler. Why that piece? And then I'll tell you why it, why it means a lot to me. Okay, well, I, I love that piece forever. It, and it's kind of morbid, but I, um, when I, the very first time I heard it, well, I can't remember when it was, but I sh definitely should not have been having thoughts about death at that time. And when I heard that second movement, I thought, I want my body to be brought into that song. <laughs> you know, I, that's what I thought, even as a young person, I just thought that so is so I. dramatic. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second movement. It's a little bit. I mean, I I'll give you Fred. It's a little bit dramatic. Obviously, you know, I don't tell many people about that. But um, no, I love the piece. I really, yeah. really love this piece. Um, and another one of my favorite recordings of it is by Murray Pariah. Um, That's my go-to recording. Yep. Is it so? I, I, I also think the quality of the studio sound is like, I want to ring up Murray Pariah and go, where did you record that? Because because the piano, you know, obviously with his touch, but the, the actual surrounding of the, of the studio sound just sounds absolutely glorious. Uh, but I picked Menachem because, because I know Menachem and I got to work with him and um, we played a Mozart gala together in Texas. And Talk um, about him and why he's special in case some of our listeners don't know Menachem, who he is. Menachem is uh, one of the members of the Beaux-Arts trio. He's 95 years old now um, and he is playing as superlatively as he ever has. He's just one of the most 
he is, he kind of makes me cry actually. I mean, just because I'm so, <laughs> I was so moved when I met him before he said anything, I had been rehearsing on a piano um, in, in, in the concert hall. Um, and this is of course like, you know, no offense to the, the person playing the piano before because they were playing beautifully. Menahem sat down at this piano and started, we started to play and I mean, he was only playing the melody. I mean, just not next to nothing. That piano took on a life that I didn't recognize having just spent 45 minutes on it. Um, and, and I was, um, I was, I was just amazed. And, and he said the most, he, I mean, he said, he said so many amazing things, but it was really amazing to me to meet somebody as accomplished and ex as experienced to him as him. And then he said to me, he said, have you done this piece before? And I said, oh no, this is my first time. So anything that you have to say, please say, I, I'll, you know, I would love to know your opinion. He went, he sort of started muttering to his, his wonderful partner, Annabelle. He said, oh, that is so great because I have also not done this piece. And I'm like, and I was thinking, <laughs> Menachem Pressler is having, you know, a debut of the piece. At, and that, at that time he would have been, I think, 93. Yeah. Um, and what an incredible man. I mean, he is a force of nature. He's a very, very beautiful soul. He's, he's incredibly generous. Um, and he's, he has so much insight, uh, even at his age to share, you know, he's incredibly articulate. So he's not a 93 year old who's losing it in any shape or form. I mean, neither physically nor mentally. Um, and and nor with his dexterity. I mean, we played, we then reunited. I invited him to come. I was doing a recital at Queen Elizabeth Hall to reopen the Queen Elizabeth Hall after the after it's um, I think it's it was going through a period of restoration. And um I thought I would turn it into a chamber music concert instead of just me and recital because I love chamber music and I never get to do enough of it. And so I rang up Menahem and I said, How do you feel about getting together? To, to do some chamber music. And he was like, oh, this is wonderful. Let's get together. Oh, I'm so excited. And so I got Menahem, James Galway, um, uh, the boat, the, the, the Navarro String Quartet. Um, um, I'm just trying to remember all the people, but it was, it, was a, it was a star studded thing it ended up being with all these incredible legends. And, um, and uh, it was just one of the best nights of my career. It was so fulfilling. And and I was quite nervous. I remember being nervous before I started singing one of the pieces. And then I thought, Menahem is picking up his 95-year-old fingers to play the piano right now. I shouldn't um, be nervous. Like, I should enjoy this, you know? I, it was such an honor to sing with him. Something I firmly believe in and always have, I did when I was a kid and I do as a 64 year old and I hope to as a 95 year old, is the concept of mentorship and the concept of passing along what you know. When I went to graduate school yeah. here in New York, I graduated on my 24th birthday and it was the saddest day of my life because I felt I love learning and I'm not going to learn anymore. And then I realized you learn for your whole life, but I had to start yeah. teaching what I knew. So the incoming class at my grad school, I created a mentoring program in which older graduates and new ones such as myself would work with the ones coming in. And ever since that's been part of my, the way I, I run and you have met in your long young career i say that because you're young but you i didn't mention to the audience you made your met debut at the age of 19 and i was there i didn't know you then but i was at your yeah. debut as barbarina and lenozzi di figaro yeah. and donna was cecilia bartley and Bryn turville and renee fleming and Dwayne croft and suzanne menser james levine conducting it was an incredible Jonathan Miller production. And so you at 19 were with all of these legendary people, learning from them, no doubt. Absolutely. And I imagine now that you've had a career that's, you can say how long, would, would you say 22 years? Would you say longer? 
Um, well, yeah. I mean, I would say minimum 22 years. I mean, I made yeah. my recital debut when I was 11. Then I made my opera debut when I was 15. My Met debut when I was 19. Yeah, it's like 25 years, you know. So it's, you it's find best. yourself now in the position of mentoring and teaching younger people? Well, I've been asked to do lots of master classes, and I really love doing master classes. And the first one I was asked to do when I was about twenty, and that was surreal because you did some a of the people class when you were twenty. Yeah, I remember when I went to do a recital out in the Midwest somewhere. I was asked to do a master class with the college kids, and it was it was weird. I was in college, <laughs> you know, um, but I also I thought it was kind of wonderful. It was an opportunity for me to kind of say, you know. I did many master classes myself, uh, from Scotto to um, to Georgina Resnick to Soderstrom to Thomas Stump to, to so many different um, to Hefliger to to so many different um, artists and you know you can get really put through your paces in a master class. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> so you know I I. I, I used the opportunity when I was younger to just say, you know, actually, I'm working on this too. So, um, you know, uh, I remember very well saying in that very first masterclass, I said, you know, how do you feel that went? So that at least because as many times I wanted when I was a young singer to just say, um, I know that I messed that one thing up, but I actually, I, I didn't intend to, it just happened. And then a, a master teacher might spend time correcting something that you, you already know you just went wrong that one time or something like that. And so um, I remember asking people to do that when I was 20 and thinking, wow, this is cool. I'm going to be such a cool master class teacher. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it, they were wonderful. And I do love doing them. And, and they're very, um, multifaceted experiences for me because you know you you can't approach every singer in the same way and you don't have a lot of time as well so um sure. also you know singers come up and they're they're you can watch them and go I know that they would be interested by working on this aspect of it so sometimes it's about um you know, coming out of your shell. It's not, it's not, sometimes it's about the text, but sometimes it's about technique, but then technique can be a little bit hairy sometimes because um, depending on the age, uh, you don't want to like get too much into it, especially if they're younger singers. And if they're like, I don't know if their teacher is in the audience, you know, the last yeah. one I did at USC, I was, um, I was asking, you know, I was, I knew the teachers were in the audience. So I said, you know, tell me if you've been saying something else, you know, otherwise, but this is what strikes me as. And I, I love, um, yeah, I love that feeling of, um, sharing something that to me is also an exploration because I don't, um, always know all of the reps. So I'm looking at what's in the music alongside the singer and we can discover some things there. There's so much in the music. That's what I find really, that's what I find so amazing about what we do is that um, everything is there in the score. You give it life, but, but the clues are there. You know, and sometimes people will say to me, you know, they go, oh my God, how did you think of that? And I, I do find myself saying, but it's right there. It's like, I, maybe I can see it better than others, but I can see it and, and, and it is all there for the taking. And I, I adore that about music and about, you know, even like doing well-known roles. Like my first Rosina was like that for me. I, 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 Barbara Seville, yeah. It was a whole new world. Yeah, it was just a whole new world. And I saw things that I, I went, okay, now I know how I want to play this character. I want to be like this. You know, and um, I, I adored it. I adored that process. So I'm going to mention a few things because you and I are like tennis players, the way we talk. We always have been. Um, <laughs> the And you've actually put a lot over on my side of the net that I want to hit a few back. Um, one was That's this cool. idea of passing along, but also learning as we teach. Uh, you know that my main working life has been opera, but I've had a second life in journalism and writing and broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And when I was a student in Italy in the 1970s, I was at La Scala in 78, 79. And that was a time of the rise of high fashion, Giorgio Armani, uh, Ferre, all of those people were young and just starting out. And it was also the time of terrorism in Italy. 
and the prime minister had been kidnapped and killed and streetcars in Milan were being blown up. And so it was an unusual time to be there because we would wear stylish clothing as we ran away from bombings. And I was a stringer, which means sort of a freelance correspondent for Newsweek magazine then in Milan. And my beat would be one day go to a fashion show, the next day cover wow. the explosion of a streetcar. And a man named uh, Christopher Dickey came to Milan. He was just a few years older than I. And he was an incredibly generous, suave, elegant, your idea of a foreign correspondent. And he headed the Newsweek Bureau in Paris, and then he went to the Daily Beast. And I'm speaking of him in the past because unfortunately he died yesterday. And there have been so many tributes to Christopher Dickey that have come out that even though he was the paragon, he died in Paris of heart failure very quickly. And he was the paragon of that profession. And when people like that suddenly go, normally if, if people die, they die a little slower, but this was an instant operatic death. And he really wow. famously, so many people are coming out and saying, Christopher Dickey took me aside here and said, I like your piece, your article, but this we can do better. Or you may want to think about that. And everywhere he went, and I met him and he was just four years older than I am, but he, even that four year difference when I met him in Milan, he started helping me. And it really was a model. I, I had the tendency anyway, it was really a model for a way to live in your profession and live in your life that kindness and generosity should not be given with expectation of getting it back, but just done because it's done. Sure. And so he was that way. I aspire to be that way. And I happen to know that you are that way. And so in thinking about talking mm. to you today, which is always a pleasure, I've been thinking about Chris. And, and I mentioned this because I described you as the very model of a modern major opera singer. What a lot of people probably don't know unless they know you is, you are an incredibly hard worker and people don't know <laughs> no. necessarily about that element of opera. The best opera singers I know all tend to be very hard workers. And you, I'm making yeah. that point because you know, I don't know. Well, I know too. because of something you just said that when you see something in the music or you see something in the text um, when I teach art I always say the more you look the more you see same with music the more you listen the more you know yeah. and you have you we all of us have an ongoing engagement with an attachment to this stuff that number one is very fulfilling and enriching for us, but it's a way of bringing across the art of the creators, combining it in your case with your own unique set of talents, but it's really hard work. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't recommend being an opera singer <laughs> to, to, to anybody really. Um, I remember, I remember when my son was born, I did a, an, an interview with uh, something like the Daily Mail or something like that. It was one of those kind of glamorous interview things. And, and they said, oh, and would, you, would you like your son to be an opera singer? And I went, God, no. And they went, oh, oh. And they, they, they turned the paper of the That's notepad. Bad, like, sure. oh, I better get that. <laughs> what, what can I quote her on? And um, the, of course, I never thought, been asked the question before because I never had a baby before. So I was, you know, um, wasn't thinking about whether there would be a bad response. I just responded automatically. But I mean, I did then follow that up by saying, it's really hard, you know, because because you don't even get to start to make it if you don't have a great voice and you don't have what it takes to be an opera singer. What, what happens between that point and the rest of your career is all the other qualities you need to have to be an artist from having a thick skin or being able to take criticism, um, call it what you like, because we probably all in some way, I feel, have thinner skins than we like to say that we have. Um, because I think one has to care and one has to be bothered what people think in order for there to be a 
dialogue. I mean, if you just, I'm not one of those artists who thinks like my art is my art and it goes out there and whatever people think, it doesn't matter because my greatness is, is what I bring out of the, out of myself and it's finished for me, my, when I'm performing, it's a, it is a complete dialogue. It's a transaction that leaves my body. And I only understand how it was when I receive it back through the audience. And that's not necessarily applause, but that could be how they digest the story or how they exhale or how they feel and how, you know, how I, how I feel that they are with me. And that, that, you know, that means that there's room for feeling hurt if it is, if it doesn't go the way you want, or if so, you know, you read a review or whatever it is, but um, you do have to have so many other qualities and then you have to have a good team around you, right? Of people who will help you make the right decisions and not steer you towards, uh, let's say how to put it, the decisions that are right for someone else that work in the moment, but that in the long term don't work for you. Um, because obviously we all know hindsight is like 2020, you know. So a lot of it is the way those things are phrased. For example, um, there are many roles or ideas or such that I would have for my singer friends. I tend not to volunteer my thoughts unless I'm asked. The last time you and I were together live was last October. I know what you're going to say I'm to not me. Gonna mention the role unless you want to. Was we're last not- October <laughs> in Milan for your La Scala debut as Cleopatra in Julio Cesare. And we had lunch and we got together and, and so forth. And we're talking about different roles and it's a role that I always had in my head in your regard. I figured if ever you asked me, I would recommend it. But the way I phrased it was, this is a role I think would be good for you and I told you why. When an artist hears you should do Brunhilde, which I wouldn't say to you, but you should do Brunhilde. Or they say to me, you should write a book about whatever. When I hear the you should, it's problematic because Mm. I wonder where that comes from. Uh, There's, again, this comes back to the mentoring thing and the advising and the sharing that sometimes people are genuinely convinced that they're right and are disappointed if it doesn't land with the same approval of, yes, of course, I, Danielle Denise, will sing Brunilda. Okay. I, no, but um, it, it's how the information is delivered. I think I can say this because it's known publicly. Renee Fleming, who's someone I admire a great deal, has a group of people who she uses as sort of a sounding board and she trusts them, but she doesn't automatically do what they say, but she trusts their wisdom and experience. And then she'll evolve her own career and decisions, which I think is a good way to do it. Um, Yeah. It's very, I mean, I've heard conductors say to singers, I want you to sing the following, or you will sing whatever it is. And so when Herbert Von Karajan said to Morella Franey, you will sing Madame Butterfly. She said, no, Maestro, I will not sing Madame Butterfly. Ultimately, they did it as a film version, but she knew, she, her nickname was La Prudentissima, the most prudent one. Um, she knew that was her nickname. It. You know, La Stupenda was Joan Sutherland, La Divina was Callas, La Prudentissima was Morella Franey. And she knew that, you know, even with someone great as Herbert von Karajan, she could and should say no. Because Mm. I think ultimately it's down to what the artist feels. If you feel a particular connection to the music of a composer, to a role, to her characteristics, then you try to do it if, if someone gives you the opportunity. But otherwise, there's nothing wrong, I believe, with saying no. I have said no so much. Um, And you're so right, Fred. I mean, that's the thing is that, I mean, also you could, because what happens is, is I think when people say yes, especially if if the request comes from a maestro, the, you feel that if they're inspired to hear that in you, that it must be within your reach. And so, um, 
it can put stars in your eyes a little bit. I mean, and I've been asked to do so many things that um, that actually, even if I could do them, I was advised by my management that maybe, for example, I don't know, whatever it was, doing that X composer with super hot big conductor for a first time in a major festival might not be the way to debut that piece. Mm-hmm. And, and you think, oh my God, but they want me to do it. The festival wants me to do it. I want to do it. So you think, oh God, like, you know, you, you, you feel this pull, but, you know, sometimes people who, if this is, if you have the good managers, if you have the good advisors around you, you know, if they truly care about what your priorities are, then um, they will give you that advice, even if you don't want to hear it. And then it's up to you whether to take it. And there are times when the stars align, when you're asked to jump on for something and it is the perfect time and it is the perfect role and you go on and, and, and magic happens. And it, it just is those, you know, I've been so lucky to have so many of those kind of experiences where a thing like that just fell into place and then a completely magical experience happened and it sort of catapulted my career to a different level. And um, you're very lucky, I think, or fortunate, I guess, if you if you get those moments. But um, there are so, I think we all know, there are so many singers who like haven't cut the distance. You know, they've done a bit and it's been great. And then they've run into something you know six seven eight years down the line you sort of um I always think of these careers are so long um but maybe that's because I started at 11 so um you know but you're sort of you're swimming in your lane and you're just working on your own swimming you're just thinking about how your strokes are and how your aerodynamics are and 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 how your air is but sometimes as you come up for air you might look in the lanes next to you and just see who's there. And it's very sad when sometimes you look up and the people who were in the lanes with you are no longer there. They've quit, they've changed careers, um, or they, you know, they've had a problem or whatever it is. And, you know, that's not a, that's not a tragedy in and of itself. I don't think, because I mean, everybody's path is different. And I guess it kind of goes back to what I mentioned about priorities. I think sometimes management's also, you know, they have an understanding about a particular singer's priorities. Now, some singer's priorities, right? We know this, you and me. I mean, I don't know. We don't have to name names, but some singer's priorities will be like, I want to sing as many roles as possible and make as much money as possible while I'm hot. Get me everywhere. Yes, I'll go to Arena de Verona. I'll go to wherever, everywhere. I'll go everywhere. And, you know, managers who know that about their singers, they'll they'll do it. They'll they'll do that. And so it just depends on, you know, then, you know, if you have the longevity if, as your priority, which I do, then um, you take different kinds of decisions. And, you know, you're, re- I think there are some really wonderful managers out there. And then of course there are, there are, I mean, managers and teachers who can, you know, unwittingly in, in, invite you into the wrong direction. Um, but yeah, it's a tough one. That's a really tough Well, there are so many factors there that you raise that you and I know, but we're talking in front of an audience, the people we don't see. But um, one of them, frankly, is that I know many, many wonderful singers who graduate from their schools, their conservatories with a lot of student debt, especially in the United States, and they have to pay off their bills. Here in the United States, we don't have national health care insurance for the most part. Um, a singer in Germany or the UK has access to health care. She needs it. Um, yeah. In terms of raising families, in terms of all of that, it is very, very expensive. And yeah. this is just about the finances. And even a very fine singer might say, book me for everything I can do now because I don't know how long the career will last. I don't know if a pandemic will come in and put a giant pause in the middle of everyone's career. And we're beginning to see the glimmerings of activity in Germany and other countries, but it's going to take a long time, unfortunately. And therefore, I, you don't judge either, I know that, but I don't judge because life gets in the way of different factors 
result in that, even among the very finest singers, it's Absolutely. nothing about yeah. their quality, frankly. It's about oh. circumstance. Yeah, and 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 that does determine your priorities. Um, and and yeah, it it is a it's a tough thing to negotiate because even even me or anyone else, we have to constantly think about those. You know, it's like going through one of those little um, remember those video games where you would have to go like this. You have to move along as the road kind of jigs, and yeah. and the road does jig, and. And and it can, but it's not where it sounds like we're saying all negative things, but actually it can jig in really wonderful ways, and you can end up doing things you never thought. Like I ended up at the Sydney Opera House reopening it to do Hannah Glavari and the Merry Widow. I didn't have the Merry Widow on my docket at all, especially to sing young, because I always thought, well, everybody's always over fifty-five when they sing the Merry Widow. I completely. But she's actually uh, younger. The, she's a young widow. Yes, and I, 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 we, we have to have a whole other session on it. But it was like, I, I fell in love with the piece. I fell in love with Hannah and Danilo, and I saw so many things there that that I didn't see in these, um, I guess like Twilight of My Life productions where you have the slightly more seasoned singers who are kind of like one last hurrah, and you know those are fantastic. That has a color to it. That is one color to the Merry Widow, but I really enjoyed finding something different. And I would never have said I saw that on my path, but I adored it. It's interesting how managers in opera houses have certain roles that they think of as older singer roles and that you can grow into that role. And a very, very famous singer and I spoke a few years ago and she asked me what role I would recommend that she do. And I recommended Adriana Lecouvre and she said, well, I'm 42 and that's an <laughs> older lady role. And I said, actually, no, she's a young character. And the reason it's described as an older role is that the range is not all that taxing. And yeah. a voice that is missing high notes or certain low notes can sing this very well. So a Tabaldi would do that later in her career. But this singer basically said, well, you know, thanks for the recommendation, but no thanks. But then she <laughs> recorded the aria on one of her albums and everyone said, gee, you would be great in that role. And she, by that time, time had passed and it was not going to be a role for her. But then she said to me, you know, you were right. And I'm sorry, I didn't do that role. Anna Netrebko did that role recently and she's young. And it worked yeah. very well for her because there's something plausible about it. And I don't think that singers necessarily have to follow this most traditional advice if they feel it themselves. Now, I'm gonna go back many topics because we didn't finish with Mozart's Piano Concerto number 23. Um. Um, <laughs> the way I discovered that it was a French film and I no longer remember the film, but we had something called the Lincoln Plaza Cinemas opposite Lincoln Center here in New York. Yeah. Wonderful foreign film house. And whatever French film this was, <clears throat> that music from the second movement was playing on the screen and suddenly I lost track of the movie. All I could mm -hmm. do was hear the, the music so powerfully and I, I assumed it was Mozart, but I didn't really know. And I stayed to read the credits to find out what is that music? And at that time we had Tower Records across the street. I ran across the street and bought the Murray Pariah recording. And the reason I'm mentioning this is, what is it about certain pieces of music in your view that hit us that way when there, there are no words in this case, it's just purely a sound that hits us in a certain way. How did that particular piece hit you when you first heard it? Well, it, it hit me like it stopped me. It stopped my thoughts and it suspended my, my pathway of thinking. So sometimes you think with destination, you think towards an idea or towards something. And this piece just, especially the second movement, it's just stops time. It stops time and it, and, it, and and of course is very dependent on a pianist and how they 
feel about the notes. So what I find really interesting is even between Mary Pariah and Menachem is that the phrasing is very, very different. Mm -hmm. The notes are the same. The rhythmic proportions are the same. Um, something I always say to, pe to people in master classes or, you know, like younger, especially younger singers is that um, you have text, you have melody, but you also have harmony. And music theory is to me the very foundation of who I am as an artist, because there is another story and the story that is first created is harmonically. So um, a, when I was mentioning clues, like many clues are to the color of text come from the harmony, not necessarily from the word, you know? <laughs> like it's not like a sort of color by numbers thing where it's like, I am cold outside and it's hot. And you don't like, you don't have to color every word, the color of the word, but there are other colors that come through the harmony. Um, and if, if you can do counterpoint and, you know, if you spent time, like I, I spent time doing Shankarian analysis and things like that. And, um, you know, if you, if you, if you understand that, then it's like you speak a third language of music, you know, so you're not just learning the notes and the words and how it goes, but you're actually able to understand like why uh, an augmented sixth chord is in there. Why is that? Where, how does that relate to that key? You know, if I was just looking at an Offenbach piece now for the summer and it's got some really interesting key changes and they, they give me insight. They give me insight to uh, other colors that, that help me feel more confident about my instincts telling me where to go with my interpretation. So um, I always highly recommend, you know, in addition to language study music theory, which I just think is the bee's knees. <laughs> and yeah, no, the, the Mozart, it's, um, I love Mozart. I've always loved Mozart. I was a Mozart singer before I was a Handelian singer. And when I made my big splash in the Netherlands opera's Cleopatra when I was 21, which was right after I finished the Met Young Artist program, everyone said, I'm now a Handelian singer. And it snowballed. I was given so many offers to do Rodrin, the Popea, Semele, everything. And um, but I was always a Mozart singer first. And and it's a great foundation. And I, I do love Mozart. And I love I love speaking him. of Mozart. Um, the next recording that you gave me to list as among your most inspiring was certainly among my most inspiring. Uh, it's called Curie to Kanawa, a portrait. And it came out in 1983. Uh, I went to work at the Met in 1980, but became performance manager in late 82, when the Met was doing Arabella, a new production, I'm sorry, first Cosi Fantute, then Arabella, um, with wonderful cast and Kira Takanoa in both. And we used, I used the word crush before. This was my first operatic crush. I was besotted musically, personally, everything. And so much so that frankly, people thought she and I were having a love affair. We were not, um, but I was besotted and she was a friend of mine and we did a lot of things together. And I remember when that recording came out because to me, she basically is sort of the paragon for many roles, when we talk in opera about someone owning a role, it doesn't mean that someone else can't do it. No. But we make Collis a reference point for Tosca, even though there are many fine Toscas. Yeah. We make, we can pick someone for uh, Violetta. These famous roles, Leontine Price for Aida. Yeah. But it's not that they quote own the role, but they really are the touchstone that we go to, to then learn and compare to other people. And Kiri Takanoa for Mozart, for Fiordi Ligi, for the Countess, for Don Elvira, oh. is really the maximum. To me, and, that's exactly the same way. And Arabella and maybe the Marshallin. Oh. And there are quite a few roles where you just, it's the way Christopher Dickey was of being the paragon in his field as, as an international correspondent. At that time, in that place, she was it. And your careers in some way mirror the different repertory 
in terms of being the model of a modern major opera singer, she was in the 80s and 90s, and you are now in terms of what the profession asks of you. And I think it's different now than then. Um, she appeared, you appear on talk shows in Britain, you're well known in Britain. Uh, yeah. She appeared somewhat on talk shows and media, but not all that much. Uh, she was criticized though, not by me, for seeming very placid and uncommitted on the stage because she did not quote overact. Um, she had this awful nickname, Dreary Kiri, that I used to yell at people really? and use that, yes, I'm sorry. Oh my God. Um, the point was, she knew what her strengths were, and there were many. And she could stand meditatively on the stage and sing Dove Sono in the Marriage of Figaro. She didn't have to move her arms about. Her no. face was so expressive. Her beauty was evident, but it was not that the beauty dominated everything else. She didn't rely on her looks. No, no, no. Um, she has one of the most gorgeous voices ever. No, I but mean, it's that's not just the sound of the voice, it was the singing. She and Carita Matila, who was another operatic crush of mine, had the same teacher in London, Vera Roja. Vera Roja, and, exactly. Who I never knew, but I would love to have known what Vera Roja saw and gave to both Carita Matila and Kiri Takanova. Very different singers. Very different people, singers. But equally magnificent and inspiring and so on. And so in my Met career, although I loved many artists and worked with many, and Leonie Riesenek would be another operatic crush, uh, but Kiri was just very, very special in that whole time because of what she represented artistically and she was a lovely person. So what made you pick Kiri Takanova, a portrait from 1983? Well, Kiri has been my idol. I mean, that was my idol when I was a kid. So I started singing at, um, you know, eight with classical lessons. Did and it have to do, I'm sorry to interrupt, with she being from New Zealand and you being from Australia? Yeah. She won yeah. the Sonaria competition in Australia. And I remember my parents saying to me, Kiri won the Sun Aria competition. So you could win the Sun, Sun Aria competition. Kiri is from a mixed background, yes. being from New Zealand. And you're from a mixed background. So if Kiri can do it, you can do it. You know, and, and that was pretty, you know, I mean, I don't know if they said it exactly to, to be able to quote them in that way, but I knew those things about her. And I knew that that was similar to me. Even as a small, small child, I thought, she's as close to what I would want to emulate because of being also from the Southern hemisphere. And, you know, when you live in Australia, you're far, far away. So the, here was Carrie who sang at Charles and Diana's wedding. So, you know, I was a kid when I was a kid in the nineties is when I was given the portrait of my parents gave me that album. And um, I loved all of the variety in the album, you know, um, cause Carrie doesn't sing things on it that then she sang throughout her career. I mean, Carrie's not known for singing William Walton, but those are my favorite songs. And I, I did William Walton in yeah. my net final recital because of that portrait album. Yeah. Um, and I used to listen to this album and I'm, I'm a very girly girl, Fred. So I had, when I was a kid in LA, I had like a canopy bed that had um, like netting curtains all over it. And I used to, I used to spend a lot of time listening to that album and picking up the, the tool of the netting and kind of <laughs> acting out Daphne or acting out, acting out different things. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I'm so lucky, I got to study with Carrie and Carrie lives 10 minutes down the road here. And um, to study with your idol was totally daunting at first and then incredible and then so moving because she made it such a safe environment for me to rebraid some parts of my voice that I was working on and um to have somebody you idolize make it so safe um I I, I rest in awe of her and I am probably more in awe of her ha having known her like from the mito the legend to the to the to the real flesh and blood person um she is truly amazing. And, and 
what I learned also is that I, what I remember people saying about Carrie was like that voice, that voice, that voice, that voice. And they also, it, it was implied that it was so almost effortless that they just kind of implied like, oh, well, that's her thing. Almost she came out like that. She opens her mouth and that sound comes out and what a glorious sound it is. But no, when I was studying with her, I realized that Kiri is a rather amazing technician. She knows where every note is, how her tongue feels, how her palate feels. Um, she has a very, very strong sense of technique. And, and she said to me quite a few times, well, she said a lot of funny things to me. One thing she said to me, the, the first thing she said to me was, do you know what the top three priorities that you should be thinking of? When, when it comes to a singing career. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm, what day I'm carrying? And she said, me, me, and me. And when I say me, 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 I mean you, you, you. You should be thinking about yourself, yourself and yourself because nobody else is going to think about that. They'll hand you this, they'll hand you that, but your voice is the ticket. So you have to conserve that at all costs, you know, because yep. that's the thing that people come to see. And I learned that, you know, that's how Kiri thinks. And I actually think that's incredibly wise because- I think as a singer, everybody has a particular fantastic quality that they become known for. So for Kiri, it was her incredible, creamy, rich, glorious sound. For Carlos, it was something else, her temperament, her, her, her total package artistry. Um, for Tabaldi, it was the voice again. For Scotto, the temperament and, and the voice. So temperament, I kind of include voice as well. But um, but for the for Kiri, you know, providing that incredible sound is what people came to hear. So fair enough. She's not going to say, well, let me just sing, bleh, like, you know, let me give it my all everywhere else in the range. No, if she needed to turn in those top, beautiful top notes at the end of a capriccio or whatever it was, you know, whatever had to be done to make sure that the, the, that last 20 minutes, you know, was amazing, was done. And, and, and I think she's totally at peace about that. I mean, I think everyone should be, we should all think about the quality that we want to remain known for, or that is our strength and, and celebrate that above everything else. I remember that, and this goes back to what we were saying before about you singers and musicians having a public career and dialoguing with the public. And I said, but there are certain singers who wisely maintain a certain distance. She did that. I mm -hmm. think she was friendly and cordial with fans, but there was not a wall, but there was a reserve, which I found very becoming and appropriate. And um, many fans are know-it-alls and you hear them talking and now on social media, you see them writing comments. And my inclination is always to say, you have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. And when they say things are just preposterous. But I remember once with her, she was appearing here in New York with a conductor who had a propensity to conduct quite loud. And um, he was conducting the way he was and she was not going to scream and shout over that loud sound because number one, to protect her voice, and number two, because it wouldn't sound as good. So she let him in effect drown her out. And she wasn't happy about it, but I remember certain people saying, she can't sing out, she's lost her voice, she has no volume, and I, when it was appropriate said, excuse me, maybe the conductor was too loud and it yeah. was not her at all. Because yes, me, 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 in the sense of if you want a career, you have to take certain precautions. And one of them is, as Leontine Price always said, only rely on the interest and never touch the principal, the principal being the voice. Um, yeah. If you have a thousand dollars, don't spend a hundred of it let it earn some interest and use the interest and do not ever touch that thousand dollars. So we're going on to the next of your recommendations because again, um, it's one that I would have picked. Um, Schubert's Shepherd on the Rock, specifically sung by Benita Valente, another operatic crush of mine. It's like you've picked- oh, hey. 
<laughs> incredible. I mean, I saw her about a year ago in Philadelphia, and she's an older person oh, now. Uh, and it was like my love. it was like being with Ingrid Bergman, and <laughs> I I'm not shy about speaking, but I sort of stammered when I there I was with Benita Valente. So what is it about this? And, and is it the music? Is it Benita Valente? Is it both? It's everything. Um, so so Benita, I got to work with when I was at Marlboro Festival myself. And I have a very, very um, um, warm place in my heart for Marlboro Festival because, yeah. um, you know, not many people get to go there. But if you go there, you are part of a group of people who 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 value the same things about music so um you know when it is a sanctuary in a way Marlboro because and for people who don't know it's a chamber music festival in Vermont in a very tiny little town it's probably one of the last places on earth where you can still perform and the performance is not the final destination because there's not really an audience where you know um I mean, there's an audience of people who live in the area and they are absolutely adoring of everything that happens at Marlboro. But it's not like you're facing the sort of like harshest critics on the planet or anything like that. Um, it's all love. It's all love. So, you know, you start out by sending a list to Marlboro of all the pieces you would like to work on and they cross-reference them with your fellow musicians. Um, yeah. So you're not only there with singers, but more and more than other instrumentalists and a few singers get to go. Um, the singer, the kinds of instrumentalists that were there, I'll give you an example, was I did a masterclass with Ernst Hefliger there. And I studied with him for about two weeks, you know, in masterclasses where any, anyone could attend from, from the festival. But the person playing the accompaniment for me for that was Lang Lang. Yeah. You know, uh, Hilary Hahn was there, um, you know, Sirkin, Mitsuko's there all the time, you know, I adore Mitsuko and, and we, we- Sirkin Rudolph or Sirkin Peter? Peter. Or both, Peter, yeah. Peter, um, but, but, and Benita's there, Benita yeah. Valenti was there and I got to work with her a lot. Um, and Shepherd on the Rock was on my list for Marlboro and I got to do that out there with her um and i and and i also got to the libus leader waltzes which is also on that same disc um out there and and i did them in tangle at tanglewood as well so i i i, I wish everyone could go to marlboro and it it has um cemented my already what i what i already had in my teenage years a huge love for chamber music and i think it is so um valuable to a singer if you can understand the microcosm of how chamber music works um, and the communication that's required between a small group of people, that same thing is necessary even if you do an orchestral concert. And, and sometimes I find, Fred, when I do orchestral concerts, that sometimes the players, they're rather surprised when I turn around to rehearse with them. Yeah. Um, they're so used to just playing softly and accompanying and they're not, they're, they're always being asked to do less and less and less and less. And, I sometimes turn around and we talk a little bit about what the aria is and and I love for them to know that and to to give more because it's a give and take you know I sing a phrase and then I give it to them and then they sing a phrase and then they return it back to me and that dialogue requires engagement from both sides of uh the, from orchestra to singer and singer to orchestra of course with the maestro there in the middle of it all um making that happen so um yeah, I picked that because, uh, and Shepherd on the Rock is one of the things I did with Menachem at the Queen Elizabeth Hall. So, um, which was the other amazing time I got to sing it. Um, and I love the piece so much. It's another one of those, it's a little bit like the Mozart. You stop, you stop when you hear even, da -da. I don't need to hear anything more than that. I know exactly where I am. Yeah. I know which hillside I'm on. I can see it. And, and, and that's a magical piece. It's such a magical piece to hear Benita do it is to like hear God's angel do it. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> she is the chef. She is the, 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 the girl, you know, uh, on the, on the rock. Uh, did you ever <laughs> from Gluck's Orfeo and Eurydice, did you ever work that role of Eurydice with Benita, because I heard her sing it with oh, really? Marilyn Horn in Santa Fe. Yeah, a lot of years when I worked there. 
I didn't, I didn't work that role with her, but I can imagine she'd be perfect for it because Benita oh, yeah. has the ability to like, she really cradled her singing, you know, like the cradling of the voice is a very beautiful thing. I find that very attractive. It's not necessarily something I always do, but, but it is something that I find very attractive in a, in a, in a singer. The first a, time I heard her in opera was actually at the Met when we were doing our first handle, which was Rinaldo with an all-star cast, including uh, Benita, Samuel Ramey making his Met debut, Marilyn Horn. It was oh outstanding. My God. In 19, December, 1984, if I remember. And, um, and in that bunch, I had heard the others, but Benita was, just blew me away. It was wonderful. Donna Rafanti, if I recall, was the tenor. It was quite a cast. So the next piece you picked is also Schubert. And I in no way dispute the piece, Andi Musik, which is just a perfect song. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it does it. It's just one of the greatest songs ever written. However, this is where we diverge just a little bit. The singer you chose was Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, who definitely, yeah. for, for me, is not a crush. And I don't mean personally. I've met her, and she was very correct and proper, a little stern, but... <laughs> I, I dealt with her a fair amount and, and I'm not bringing my experience with her to the, the judgment, but for many people, she was the paragon of leader. Her husband, uh, Walter Lega, and she lived in London and recorded all of these things. And it was a golden era in the 1950s and 60s, along with Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. Mm. But I can't think of anything, whether it's her opera roles, including Donna Anna and all those Mozarts, because there's sort of a line of women, including Schwarzkopf and Lisa Della Casa and Kiri and Renee Fleming and you and who do these roles. And um, at least on recording, they didn't do it for me. And I'm not saying that she was bad. I'm just saying that I wasn't touched. And yet clearly you are touched by that performance. What is it about that that touched you? Well, it's interesting. I, I love her as a singer. And I picked that song because I love the song. So it's not that necessarily that is my favorite rendition of the song. But one of the things I like about Schwarzkopf is that I, I admire so much how distinctive her sound is. There is, I think... Anyone, if they got to know her voice, they'd pick it out in l less than two notes. Um, she has so much distinctiveness to her sound. And so much of that is wrapped up in the way she, the way in which she masks its text. Um, and lots of like Lisandi and things like that, that she does that, you know, I, I've in hearing many of her recordings, I always thought to myself, one thing I can love is, is that it's got her stamp all over it. It's got her flavor. It, she, when she does it, it doesn't sound like the way that anyone else does it. And then, yes, that goes back to what you were saying, that like maybe you wouldn't be moved by it or maybe it wouldn't be the best rendition of it. But I guess what I admire in her is that it is undoubtedly hers. And, 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 and that's a kind of for better or worse thing. Like I even have this funny recording of her being Gretel, and it's all, it's like, and it's, it's so kind of, it's, it's sugar candy kind of thing. And you think, I would never have thought that Schwarzkopf would be singing Gretel, but, but there she is kind of, you know, she's putting all of her nuance into every little bit. And it's like, you know, it's like silly putty, like sometimes the way she sings, cause it's, oh, and also there's a Carrion re recording of her in the Marshland. Do you know yeah, that recording? I, I, I know. The German and the, the manner and, and the impeccability is all there. She has the manner. You're very right. That's the thing. Yeah. It's a manner. It's a mannerism that she has that is all hers. I mean, in the Carrion Trio, what I love about it is that it's treated like a piece of chamber music. Now, maybe he did that in the studio. I don't know. But at least to me, what I hear in the recording is that it's it's like it singers dial down to bring other singers up. And that's a very Musica da Camera chamber music approach to that trio whereas yep. most of the time when I hear that in concert or hear it in an opera everyone's just sing for your life right <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like screaming and you just think like over I'm the orchestra as well right and so in that recording I I go oh my god this is like the most 
intimate thing. And when you consider what they're saying, it is intimate. Yeah. So yeah, no, anyway, but that was a tangent. Um, anyway, that's what I kind of, and, and then I heard her do some rep like uh, that I sang when I was a kid. And I guess I, I, what I admire is her range, even if it's not all convincing, but that she takes a stab at everything. Like I heard her sing Mausfallen Sprüchlein, um, which was a song I sang when I was nine. And, you know, I thought, okay, here's the great Schwarzkopf. Let's, what is she going to do with Mausfallen Sprüchlein? And, and she was like, Kleine Gäste, Kleine Haus, lieber Mäuse, no, der Maus, schnell, die Schnur. And I was like, wow, it's so, it's so colorful and hurt. You know? Colorful is the word. <laughs> so that's why I chose her because I, 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 you know, for better or worse, I have a lot of her recordings and, and I always know what I'm getting when I get her. Whereas, yes. and I, and, and I admire that 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 distinctiveness because I do think that's one of the most important things and why certain singers like kind of make it and register a career that actually kind of embeds down and then lasts for a long time because one of the things that's so amazing about the world today is is that there is singer after singer after singer after singer after singer after singer hundreds of gorgeous sounding sopranos hundreds and hundreds of gorgeous sounding mezzos you know, one after the next, they'll all sound absolutely gorgeous. But can you pick them out of a lineup is what counts. Yeah. Is If you play them in an audio recording, can you go, I know who that is. I know who that is. That's that's this person. Because th it's that distinctiveness that makes you original. And, and yeah, that's what I admire in her. So Did you ever have, because you began so young, the circumstance to hear her, see her in a master class? No. And in fact, when I grew a love of her, I didn't know anything about her. It's since that time when I was a kid and had her CDs that then I learned a lot about like how she is as a person or her views and the way she treated people. Or well, I won't even go about views and politics because I, I can separate that. Yeah, me too. Um, me too. But she was so formidable, forbidding frightening all these f words in master classes that i never felt she had the desired effect of transmitting her great knowledge no I know. because she would reduce people to puddles on the stage and it was we would sit in the audience feeling awful for the singer who was being belittled and oh it was just shocking was you know it's hard for singers that. it's hard for singers when that happens too yeah when, when I've been I've been the singer that's been tested by by a master teacher and not been not been succeeding but like trying and I, you know you just it's, it's head in the hands kind of moments and and actually and I've been in in lots of classes where they a, a singer kind of went after one particular singer you're coaching an ensemble or something and the singer just went after the person doing the role that they did and it was never as good as how they did it and so they were gonna nip, 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 you know. <laughs> and that's actually the very specific thing is that certain, not all, but certain few master teachers, when they hear other people doing their roles, become very territorial and they say, well, I did this and I did that. Uh, the good ones will say, when I approach this series of notes, which are hard to get through the passaggio, um, this was the trick I used and maybe it will help you. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but not, you don't understand Violetta. You will never understand Violetta and therefore you should not do the role. Of it. <laughs> no, that's, that's really tough. But then again, all of, I feel like all of those experiences, the good ones, the bad ones, the many in between ones that I had, um, they do prepare you for just more of that because there's just yeah. more of that when you get the, 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 the more known you get, the more people expect, the more you have the burden of their expectation that you wear upon you and, and the more you have to deliver. So um, that gauntlet just continues as you, as you go. And if it, it, you got to become good, it's sort of like going like that <laughs> and still, and still, and still going, I believe in myself. And so I'm going to keep trying, you know, because, because it's hard to always believe in yourself. And, you know, I fight mental wars with myself that people don't even know about, but that I fight 
with my own self-doubt and my own uh, goals that I set that I'm nervous about completing or that I'm battling between wanting to be absolutely in priority of the character while trying to set myself other priorities technically that I don't want people to see that I'm trying to do. I don't want to start to go all technical to focus on something, you know, it's like the ice skater that, that right before they do the, the, the triple axle or the quadruple, now it's quadruple axle. Before they do that, they just, they stop interpreting the piece. They just, they get in that zone and they're like, I've got a job coming up. Here we go. And you're like, Oh, I've just, I've forgotten what this piece is about because now I'm watching you prepare for your jump. And you know, I don't, I, that's not what I want to do on stage, but I fight with myself about that internally how 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 to yep. how to manage all of that so i had asked you to send four or five recordings and you sent four and then you very sweetly wrote to me is it okay if i include one of my recordings and i frankly if you didn't i would have added this and said that i put it on there i've done this with other artists where i've, I've added one of their recordings so again you and i picked the same recording um, Beauty of the Baroque, Danielle Denise, Harry Bickett, the English Chamber Orchestra. Uh, wonderful beginning to end. You mentioned particularly Bach. And what is it in that music that so particularly spoke to you? Well, the first, the first things that I started analyzing in theory when I was like uh, 10, 11, 12 were Bach chorales. Um, so, you know, Usually Drive Man's Desiring, for example, was one that like, this was the very first, you know, things that I analyzed and understood harmony through Bach's eyes. And um, this Schaffekun and Zichweiden. So I chose this and because I mentioned to you that I chose it on Desert Island Discs. I was asked to do Desert Island Discs, which for people who don't know is uh, quite prestigious. Um, series on the BBC that um, takes people of note or who are successful and asks them to name eight tracks that they would take with them to a desert island, one would, that would, they would salvage no matter what, and they can take uh, the Bible and the great works of Shakespeare and one other book. And um, if you get asked to do this, it's an incredible thing. If you get asked to do it when you're my age, it's insane. I mean, it's, I was not expecting to be asked so young. I was thinking maybe you're lucky if you get asked when you're in your sixties or something like that, I thought anyway. Um, <clears throat> and I put this piece on there, Fred, because it's kind of like, I'm, I'm gonna try not to get too emotional about it, but talking about battles that you fight with yourself. Um, this recording was, this track was the very first time, and I've been singing for as long as we said at the beginning of the session. Um, it was the first time I heard my voice and I, I, I remember it was the first edit. It had been sent to me and I was in my parents' house in New Jersey. We sat at the kitchen table and we put it on just the CD player. You know, it wasn't like high quality speakers or anything. It was just whatever was in the kitchen. And we were just having a listen and we put that track on and I, I thought I heard myself and it was the first time I ever thought like, oh my God, I, I sound good. Like I, I, I think I could sound good. I could be good. Actually. I kind of liked listening to it because normally I don't like listening to, not that I don't like, I, I, I find things to pick at because that's what we do you know you're like a sculptor you're constantly trying to shave at things and you're like there's one thing here one thing there you see it you see you can look at your own work like a matrix of of different equations and different things that you're balancing um and I learned through making all of my recordings my wonderful recordings with Decca that you have to be able to step back out from that detail in the fabric and go that was my best work at that time, you know, but that track was really the first time that I heard myself. And I thought I, I started to cry. I started to bawl. I mean, I had one of those, um, have you ever seen the movie sense and sensibility? Yeah, sure. You know, that yeah. moment when Emma Thompson goes like, <laughs> <laughs> she start, she just, she's held it in for so long. <laughs> and and um, it's so emotional. It's what a wonderful wonderfully written scene um, that Emma Thompson wrote for herself. Um, and 
And I had a moment like that where I was just, I couldn't believe that it was me. So that tells you a lot. I just couldn't believe it was me. I, I, and I thought, well, I don't know, maybe there is something good about my oh, voice yeah. as an artist, you know, but it's, it sounds funny to say, but it, but it, that was a moment, a real moment for me. And I, and I, I put it on Desert Island Disc because I wanted to remember feeling that moment, not because I wanted to reminisce about my own voice, you know? And so, um, so I thought I would include it here for that same reason, because it, because it was a, an important memory that I'll have for the rest of my life, that moment when I thought that. So as listeners will have gathered, you and I could do this for hours, but no. I do need to conclude. But I wanted to just mention one of the role you've done two actually, I could do 10, but I I'll mention two. Um, one of them was a role based on a book that was very popular here in the United States called Bel Canto yes. by Ann Patchett. Ann Patchett has the same birthday many years apart as Maria Callas, That's and right. but she didn't know that. Ann is one of our great writers, this won the National Book Award, uh, but apparently she, had a few false starts with opera. She couldn't quite get into it because she didn't find the right way. And someone recommended to her my book, Opera 101. And yeah, yeah. that's what got in into opera. And I mentioned this not to advertise my book, but just simply because it gave us the opportunity to communicate every so often as the book was being written and then talk about opera. And Many people will say that the character of Roxanne Koss was based or inspired by Renee Fleming. Yes, yeah. Um, Renee Fleming was the, I think her title was creative consultant at the Lyric Opera Chicago oh. when Jimmy Lopez was asked to write an opera, Bel Canto. And many people thought that Renee would play the role of Roxanne Koss. Obviously, she decided that she would not do it. I think she felt that she was a little older than the role should be or whatever reason she did. Yeah. What I've never asked you is, how did they think of you or how did they contact you to do the role? I think it was Renee. I think it was Renee okay. plus the lyric. I'd sung there and Renee, um, I, you know, I made my debut as Barbarina with Renee. And um, I think she has always kept an eye on me. I am a huge admirer, by the way, of Renee and her... Oh, and her personality and the artistry and everything that she brings vocally, which is absolutely deluxe, 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 deluxe. But that behind all of that is a, a totally genuine and authentic person. Yep. You know, that there's no like other side to Renee. And I love that about her. And um, and that she championed me for that, in addition to the lyric, was just an, just absolutely an incredible vote of confidence um, from her. And she was um she she was there during the pro the process she was there um she came around the dress rehearsal as well to see it and she she you know we'll be texting each other and it, it, she's wonderful and it, it was a great thing to be able to do that to bring that to life and what was really um strange was that the Bataclan massacre happened right when we were rehearsing this. Yes. And, um, you know, you talk about when people question what is the relevance of the arts in these troubled times, Bel Canto was exactly the piece that personified where the arts and current events collide. Um, and how does one appreciate art or even focus on art when things are so grim? And then this massacre happened and it got weird in rehearsal because there we were ducking for six hours a day with rifles and things like that. And then we would go home and CNN had this sort of running thing about the Bataclan massacre. And then it was, it got weird because you'd go back into rehearsal and you'd go, well, would someone really say this? I mean, this is quite a funny line, but would you really say that, you know, like, oh, my hair looks really bad today. Or I, I look like, I look like such a mess. Like while, while you're, in an actual hostage situation. Um, and that presented a challenge because we were kind of waiting between real life and theater, but theater is a different thing to real life. And in fact, it is a heightened thing of real life. And so 
it took a little bit of waiting to come through that, but we did, we did come through and actually go, no, there's value in a few comedy lines and things like that. And these are worth, you know, finding some light fare to provide some light relief as it were. Um, the, it was a very ambitious project because it was done yeah. in multiple languages, uh, very difficult to- Eight create. languages, including a Peruvian native language, yeah. Exactly. And Spanish, very difficult- Japanese, English, yeah. The, all of it. And then they put the subtitles, like when, when people didn't understand each other, you might see a Japanese subtitle. So, so that you would be in the same boat as Roxanne, not understanding what was going on. Um, and very difficult to create a new piece with a cast that isn't so big that you can never do the piece again, but isn't so small that you can't feel the oppressive nature of being trapped with a lot of people in a hostage situation. And that's very, very tough task. And Jimmy Lopez and Nilo Cruz did absolutely incredibly to, yeah. to, to a, an incredible feat to make that work with a cast that was still small enough to be able to reprise the piece um because of course you have to think about that if you have a cast of 30 people 30 characters people in the theater world might say well that's quite expensive to to put on again so and it was recorded it was shown on american but, television and yeah. i don't know if there exists a dvd or for a way for people to see it publicly I, I, I don't know it. if it exists on dvd i wish it i wish it did but um but pbs great performances has yes. it so if it ever was to i mean it will be constantly released again i'm sure and shown on tv and um we can always link people towards that but it was a very memorable thing you raised something that i had not thought of um as you know i came to chicago for the premiere and i knew of course about the bataclan massacre and all the terrorism happening particularly in france at that time yeah. And you and I didn't discuss that, but now when you talk about it, I certainly feel that. What you probably don't know is that after two days back in New York, I then flew to France because I had work at the Paris Opera mm. at, at the Bastille. And at the Garnier, the old opera house, they were doing a production of Mozart's abduction from the Seraglio at the Enfurunghaus dem Serai, mm. which I went to one night at Star Lisette Oropesa. And oh. I don't recall the who did the production, but it was a fascinating production because here you have issues of Islamic and Christian culture, civilizations and so wow. on, and Jews in the mix, although they were not prominent in the opera. And how do you present an opera in a city that just had experienced terrorism and demonstrations? And what they did was they put the musicians, the small orchestra on the stage and the so-called Western music for the Western characters was played by musicians in Western 18th century clothing. Whereas the musicians who played the quote Islamic music, the more Turkish music, um, were wearing what might've been worn in Turkey at that time. Wow. And therefore what they did in a very visual provocative but sensible way was, show how the music can integrate because at the moments when you had quote Western and, and Islamic or Turkish music playing together, it blended. And then you would have the Pasha who was a, a Turkish character and you'd have Costanza yeah. played by um, Lizette Oropesa. It worked so beautifully and no one ever underlined were responding to terrorism to make it relevant. They just did yeah. it. Yeah. And that's part of the genius of what opera can be. And now we're going to go to the final question, the final character. Um, you own, without oh. doubt, you own the role of Cleopatra, Handel's Cleopatra and Julio Cesare. I heard Beverly Sills do it. I heard Kathleen Battle do it. I heard all kinds of people do it. You own that role. And I'm not saying this because we're friends, but even if I never had met you, it is such a natural fit and it is an incredibly hard role. It has eight arias in all yeah. kinds of moods and temperaments. And I was working in Milan anyway last year when you made your debut, but I would have right. come anyway, even yeah. if I were not working there. Um, tell what is it about the character, the music, You've done this role now in, I think you said in the Netherlands and New York and Glyndebourne and La Bala. Yeah, what is I know. It about Cleopatra? 
Cleopatra is, I mean, it's one of the perfect roles. It's got such an incredible arc to it. Um, there's, there is so many um, facets to her and you get to see them all. Um, and it, if I could feel that a role was inside of me and we were one in the same, then Cleopatra would be one of those roles. And there are a few others that I feel that way about, but Cleopatra is just one of those, um, it's one of those ones where um, it just clicked and I understood everything that I needed to know. By the way, when I did it in my European debut, I read, I did a lot of research. I did a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. And then I went to do the Hermann's production and they went, forget all the things you know about the Julius Cesare and Cleopatra. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> but the thing is, is that knowing things, you don't need to show it that you know it. It just goes in somewhere and it percolates. And it, it um, <clears throat> I don't know which pieces of knowledge came out when, but all the different shows that I've done have brought me different colors to her. And that's another thing I love about Baroque music is that um, you've never printed your version definitively, even the Glyndebourne one, which I think a lot of people would say of all the ones I've done would be the most iconic one. Um, that was not all that I had to say about Cleopatra. And it was incredible to go back to the role 10 years later, having not sung it for a decade and come back to it at the age I am now. And I saw so many different things. And Robert and I looked at Arson. many different things. Great yeah, Robert director. Carson and I, and I have a wonderful relationship with Robert. We did Popeye together and we've done Agrippina together. And then here we came to do Cleopatra and uh, as a role together. And, um, and it was wonderful to take a cinematic look at it. Now, Robert is about, um, he, he's a different beast to the David McVicka production. So the David McVicka production has its own colors and Robert has a very distinctive style that's all his own. So, you know, this was a very mature, and when I say mature, I don't mean old, I just mean um, strategic Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. a, a, a Cleopatra where you look right into the eyes and the soul of the character. Um, and <clears throat> strategy is something that I think is very important for Cleopatra. Even when she appears to just be doing this, you know, that is part of strategy. And she was so intelligent, Cleopatra. And that was, maybe that's, I mean, maybe that's something that, that her and I have in common. Cause you know, I, I didn't know that if you would say to me, well, what people don't know unless they know you is that you're a really hard worker. That's not something I knew until you said that. But given that you said that, then I think that might be quite similar to Cleopatra. You know, people oh, yeah. one way, but actually she was very, very intelligent. And um, even her womb was not just a female vixen tool. You know what I mean? This was a legacy. This was her future. So this was a political tool that she used her femininity and even her grembo womb, mm, yeah. you know, well, it, it is, is something that she, and I say used, but I don't mean used. I mean, it was an asset to her that she utilized um, for her gain and, and the gain of the people that she loved. So, um, yeah, I love the role. I love the role and there's so much more to do. I, I would love to do it again. And, and it's one of the things I've had in my career a lot, Fred, is that people sometimes, if I said to somebody, I want to do Cleopatra again or Susanna again, sometimes people say to me, oh, you couldn't, surely you don't want to do that again. I mean, you've done, you've, 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 you've done the, the sun, the moon and the stars with that. And, um, you know, surely you don't want to do Susanna again. I mean, you do, you do other roles. And I, so, I sort of find myself kind of going, well, why can't I have done 100 Susannas or why can't I have done one, oh. 150 Cleopatras? like some of my colleagues have done but sometimes people expect me to sort of have moved on to different heights and have done now conquering new roles and new challenges and I you know I do want to do all of that but I love also revisiting things and and re-sculpting them and reshaping them in in the way that I am now with my grown-up voice or my different perspective 
as a more seasoned performer. So, you know, and then I love doing roles like you mentioned Arabella and, and, um, and, and I, and things like, I loved doing Anne True Love as well, because it Breaks isn't what progress, people expect yeah. me to do. Yeah. yeah. And it, it isn't what people expect me to do. They would expect me to have more fiery roles or roles that have more dramatic variety. And it's exactly the reason why I loved doing Anne True Love was finding an arc within an arc that has less of a, arc to yeah. it than Cleopatra does um and there's always incredible journeys to find in characters so I like I like doing the unexpected and I like resurfacing roles as well I mean which it's not what that sounds really silly because I it's not that I go towards a role with the goal of doing that but sometimes in doing a role it resurfaces Rosina was one of those and and then a Musetta that I did at Covent Garden ended up yep. being a very oh, yeah expected you know runaway success for me and Musetta is one that you would think well everyone knows Musetta but then for some reason it just it really registered with people and that was very nice it was so so wonderful so three quick things I would recommend to our listeners to read the biography of Cleopatra by Stacey Schiff I don't know if you've read it I haven't read it but we've talked about Stacy and you want to read that book it's a, yeah. one of the great biographies I've ever read and what's so interesting is it's about a person from so long ago and where there's not too much primary material documentation because she was from so long ago so it's a great book uh second thing is uh last time I saw you was Milan last October, but before that was May in London. And you were appearing in Man of La Mancha as right. the character I'll Dulcinea say. Aldonza. But what I didn't know is that you were also in rehearsal at Glyndebourne and what you were doing, you would take the train in, you'd get in for curtain, you were commuting and there was, I forget which station in London you had to get back to to get the train back that evening because you had a rehearsal the next day for Cendrillon, yeah. singing that role, Mastinet, and then coming back and doing Aldonza, Dulcinea. That's hard working. Yeah, and I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I did it. Because also that was a, a production, I've seen you in several productions, they're very hard on the knees. Uh, Belcanto was, and <laughs> Dulcinea was, they kept throwing you to the ground, and I wanted to get up and say, excuse me, that's my friend, you keep throwing her to yeah, the ground. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. No, the Sandio, that I mean, that was incredible. It was an incredible opportunity that came up, and then I was sort of going, I have to figure out a way to make this work, because the, the overlap wasn't during the performances, it was just during the rehearsal period, and so... Yeah. Um, yeah, I did do that every day. I left to go and, and commuted up because that was faster than taking a car. And then every night a car would be waiting for me to drive me back to Sussex. And I would get home at sort of one o'clock in the morning, go to sleep, wake up at nine and be back at rehearsal the next day. And it just went like clockwork. And I, I, That's hard I, working. yeah, well, well, where there's a will, there's a way. And I was very much, I had a big will to like not disturb anything about the Cendrillon yeah. process while being completely committed and in the zone when I was doing Aldonza. And fortunately, they both worked out and I, I got, I was very lucky to get incredible reviews for my West End debut and Sandrion as well. So, cause I, the, obviously the risk there was that had it not gone well, sure. it would have been my fault. They would have gone, well, you know. Sure. <laughs> Thankfully. And finally, and finally, finally, um, my last trip before the pandemic, I was in London in March. I was working and I didn't see you, but I heard you in that you, as being a modern opera singer, bring the art form and the arts to people in other media. And you do programming for the BBC. That's right. Yes. Now, how did that begin? And, and do you like broadcasting? I do. I do a lot. So, well, it began because they made a show on me called Diva Diaries, which was uh, followed me returning to the Met to sing my first Susanna in the same Jonathan Miller production in which I debuted as Barbarina. So around that premise, they followed my day in the life, which consisted of coachings and connecting with Jonathan Miller and rehearsing and, and sort of doing little diary moments about what it was like, you know, doing this role and coming back to Susanna. Um, 
And that was a big success and got a different kind of audience, even though it was a classical show, lots of kids watched it. They thought it was cool. And that was a good marker for them. Um, and then, and then it just kind of kept going from there. I did birth of an opera, uh, with, for, for the Rossini that I did, but I, in between all of that, I did like, um, the birth of a, the birth of Italian opera with Tony Papano. Um, and I did, I think a, a big handle series that they did. I was a contributor yeah. on. And slowly I started to, you know, come front and center to presenting my own pieces. And the, one of the ones I'm very proud of is one on forgotten female composers called Unsung Heroines, which uh, I made two years ago, I think it was. And um, again, got a huge reach for a program that essentially could be considered a niche classical program. It got incredible viewing figures. Um, similarly, Birth of an Opera had an incredible um rating and then everyone who watched it stayed on to watch a lot more of the barber of seville broadcast than would have had they not seen the companion piece that gives you the insight in so that providing that insight providing that that um pathway in is is why i do this it's 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 just another way of doing what i do i love doing that i've done outreach since i was a kid it was um it's an extension very much of me and uh very luckily even in COVID times i still have the ability to put together programs where we can film in controlled situations and i can still bring music to people and still um share music with people so, you know, only that I was supposed to go to La Scala in September for Agrippina and that I know. moved, but I know. I'll go back another time. I know, I know they'll get me yeah. back. So, yeah. So we could go on for hours. It's I wonderful know. to see you. I love you. You too, and Fred. Same to you. Lots and lots of love and love to everyone who's watching. Um, to all of you. you are. Uh, my guest next week is Isabel Leonard, a mezzo-soprano. Great. And I love to Isabel. We've done together. Know, you, you, she was Carabino. You were Susanna yes. or you were Barbarino? Yes. In, no, in the in the one that we did that, that was on Diva Diaries, I think she was Carabino. And then we did we did it again. And we did Cosi Fantute together. That's uh, right. Which was broadcast just recently. You were just being yeah. a Dorabella. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 She's a darling. Good. Oh, Danielle, well, thank, you, thank you so much. Take care, you Fred. Wait. Be well in New York. And you be well wherever you are in the world. Thanks. Love you too. Bye-bye.